So we would like to welcome Whitney. Take it away, Whitney. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction. I am so thrilled to be here. Can everyone hear me and see me? Am I live? You're, li you're live, and uh, we, I think you have the focus here. We can see you and hear you. Awesome. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here and share with you today. It's really such an honor and a pleasure to participate in a conference with such an important mission. I'm going to be moving over to my slides now. Um, if at any point you're having trouble hearing me, seeing my slides, don't let me keep going without uh, letting me know. So I am logged into the Slack channel. I hope you are too. We're going to be doing some um, participation, some interactive stuff during my talk. So go on over to the Slack channel if you're not already, if you don't already have it open. Um, and we're going to be participating together, interacting in the general channel. So if at any point you're not able to hear me or if my slides fail, please let me know in that channel as well. I'll be uh, looking there and I have notifications turned on. So let's pull up my slides and see how this goes. Is it looking good? Do you see full screen and everything? It's looking good. Awesome. All right. So today, the title of my talk, Do You Speak Jackal or Giraffe? Designing Sustainable Relationships. So these are some common statements that I think many of us think about the places that we work and the people that we work with. My boss hates everything I do. They won't let me do it the right way. She never listens. He gets in my way. He derails every meeting. He doesn't take me seriously. She's a slacker. I don't get any credit. They don't respect my authority. I always get shot down. She doesn't have what it takes. I'm stuck. I can't do anything right. Anyone else? have these thoughts and feelings. This is the kind of stuff that I was consumed with for a very long time. A lot of blame and a lot of shame. My head was always filled with these judgments and these criticisms of everyone around me and especially myself. And as we're here today to talk about sustainability, this is, these are the three spheres of sustainability. The environmental sphere, the economic sphere, and the social sphere. And what I want to focus on today and the area that I'm most passionate about is social sustainability. How do we make things more bearable and more equitable? And what role does that play in bringing sustainability for all. So thwink.org defines social sustainability as the ability of a social system, such as an organization, to function at a defined level of social well-being indefinitely. Meaning that the communities that we participate in from society all the way down to the local communities that we're a part of every day, needed to be able to operate in a healthy way over the long term. Another definition offered at sociallife.co is that social sustainability is a process for creating sustainable, successful places that promote well-being by understanding what people need from the places they live and work. And so how can we determine what 
the best processes are, what the best practices are for creating these places and these spaces where we can effectively understand what everyone needs and to serve those needs over the long term. Now this whole understanding what people feel and need thing, that's empathy. And empathy is a topic that I have spent a lot of time studying, researching, writing about, talking about, and sharing with others. But this understanding what people feel and need, this includes ourselves. We are part of that. And so part of what I really want to encourage as we think about what social sustainability means is how to meet and understand everyone's needs, including our own. Now, as UX practitioners, we already have a bunch of empathy practices that are, are common in our work. We have user research, we have usability testing, empathy mapping, we have simulators that try to get us closer to approximating the ergonomic challenges or the accessibility challenges of our users. But what empathy practices do we have with our colleagues and our clients? What empathy practices do we have to understand their feelings and needs or for understanding our own? So I went looking for these in an attempt to get all those judgmental and critical and blaming thoughts out of my head because I knew that that was not going to lead to sustainable relationships in my work and in my life. And that eventually led me to nonviolent communication. This book was written decades ago by Marshall Rosenberg and it spawned a movement around people who are coming together to learn a new language, a new way of conversing that is more sustainable that allows for us to have greater health and greater longevity in our relationships. And what violent means in nonviolent communication is acting in ways that result in harm. It doesn't only mean physical violence. In fact, it's much more than that. But as we think about our efforts towards a more sustainable world, we are trying to reduce the ways that we act that ultimately result in harm. And so what I want to share with you is what I've learned from the practice of nonviolent communication in allowing me to create more sustainable relationships, particularly in the workplace. Now, one of the first principles of nonviolent communication is that our world offers abundant resources for meeting needs. I want to say that again, because we're here to talk about sustainability. Our world offers abundant resources for meeting needs. Now, this might be counter to what we currently think. But this is a primary principle. It's not that we are lacking the resources. It's that we're misusing them. And so Bay NVC, which is one of the leading organizations in the nonviolent communication space, says that when human beings are committed to valuing everyone's needs, and have regained their skills for fostering connection and their creativity about sharing resources, we can overcome our current crisis of imagination 
and find ways to attend to everyone's basic needs. Sustainability occurs when we recognize the abundance of our resources and we do a better job of more creatively utilizing them so that they meet everyone's basic needs. So let me tell you a little bit about the language of nonviolent communication. I just want to check in. Everyone hear me okay? Everyone seeing my slides? James or Jen, can you pipe in and tell me, am I still on air? Yeah, absolutely. And um, if that ever changes, we'll uh, either say something here and uh, we'll talk to you on Slack as well. Thank you so much. I care so much about this stuff, I want to make sure everyone can hear me. Okay, so I posted a link to a handout that we're going to be using today, and that is posted in the Slack channel, in, excuse me, in the Slack group in the general channel. So I encourage you to go ahead and check that out now. Make sure you have that ready because I'm going to be asking you to use that in just a minute. I'm going to need your help. So here we are. In nonviolent communication, we talk about these two languages, the language of the jackal and the language of the giraffe. Now, for those of you who are sticklers, this is probably more accurately to scale. But for the sake of seeing the beautiful detail of this jackal, let's leave it here. So the jackal is, as an animal, an opportunistic omnivore. It's a scavenger, highly territorial, very competitive. And so in nonviolent communication, the jackal represents judging, and it, in that judging, it separates us. So the jackal is the symbol of separating. Meanwhile, the language of the giraffe is like the animal itself. The giraffe is an herbivore. It has this open, ever-changing group and social system, not territory at all, very inclusive. And because it has the largest heart of any land animal, it's considered to be very compassionate. So the giraffe represents the ability to connect. So whereas the jackal separates the giraffe connects. And so we're going to be exploring the language that we use and how that can serve to separate us or connect us. And as you can imagine, when it comes to promoting sustainability, we really need to aim to connecting us so that we're all cared for for the long term. So let's go back to those statements, those statements that I am a little ashamed, a little embarrassed, but feel like I'm ready to admit flood my mind all the time. And I imagine they probably flood yours as well. All of these statements, all of these thoughts, ideas, these flood our mind and it is what we would refer to as jackal speak. So our jackals are angry, they're, they're yelling when we experience these thoughts. So we want to have a way of taking these jackals and noticing them, noticing how these thoughts are filled with judgments and criticisms and blaming and shaming and how that only serves to separate us. And we want to try to translate that into a new language, the language of the giraffe, 
a more compassionate language that serves to connect us. So what I'd love to do is just t tackle one of these and try to translate it from jackal to giraffe. So let's start with the jackal statement, my boss hates everything I do. Who's ever felt this before? Who might be feeling it right now? Or know someone who feels this? Or can identify with what this feels like? My boss hates everything I do. It's a very limiting feeling. It's a very, it's a very upsetting experience. And it is only serving to separate me from my boss or fill in the blank. It doesn't have to be my boss. So we really need to, to find another way to work with this. So the first step that we do in translating this from jackal to giraffe is to try to observe from a non-judgmental standpoint why I having, I'm having this thought. So if I'm thinking my boss hates everything I do, some of the things that I might be observing are as follows. My boss gives me lots of feedback on my work. My boss asks me lots of questions about my work. My boss requests many iterations and alternate solutions. My boss attends every meeting. I frequently solicit feedback from my boss and my colleagues. And I receive feedback even when I didn't ask for it. These are all observations because they're actually actions that we can observe. This is not the judgment of how my boss feels, what my boss thinks about me. It is objective observations. My boss gives, my boss asks, requests, attends, solicit, receive. These are actions. And therefore, they are observable. That, so we start our translation from jackal to giraffe by brainstorming these observations. Can you brainstorm anything else? Think of anything else that I or you, someone who's thinking, my boss hates everything I do, something that they might be observing that we can capture here as well. And again, participation encouraged in the general channel on Slack. There are all sorts of things. We can come up with an endless list here for things that my boss might be doing or that I might be doing, observable actions that would suggest to me in my interpretation of it that my boss hates everything I do. What we want to do next is move on to the next step here in our translation. And that is to say, let's just pick one of these observations to move forward with. I'm going to pick when my boss, um, my boss gives me lots of feedback on my work. Okay, so let's do that. So when my boss gives me lots of feedback on my work, observable, I feel is the next step that we take to translate this. So some things that I might feel, I feel insecure. I feel anxious. Now go ahead and check out that list of feelings and needs that I provided you, the handout in the Slack channel, and give me some ideas of what other feelings might be that I am experiencing when my boss gives me lots of feedback on my work. And I can switch for a moment and try to pull up that PDF so that we can take a look at it together. All right. So 
you can be looking at your feelings and needs handout that I've offered you. And so the top half of the first page, these are feelings we may experience when our needs are being met. So these are kind of more positive oriented feelings. The second half of the page are feelings we experience when our needs are not being met. These are more negative oriented feelings typically. So when I'm, um, when I, I receive a lot of feedback on my work, I might be feeling insecure, anxious. I'm seeing some people in the general channel saying guarded. I might be feeling apprehensive. I might be feeling alarmed. Maybe I feel uh, disappointed or discouraged. Maybe I feel scared or stressed. There are probably a lot of feelings that come up when I'm receiving all of this feedback. So that's, that's how we begin. Getting in touch with what we're actually feeling when we notice that we're getting a lot of feedback. Now that you have that sheet pulled up, I'm going to go back to my slide. Okay, so we came up with a lot of good ones here. We're now going to move from these feelings, insecure, anxious, alarmed, apprehensive, guarded, and now we want to look at why is that? What needs do we have that are not being met that those feelings are signaling? So the notion behind nonviolent communication is that all the feelings we experience are pointing to needs that are met or not met. And therefore, when we notice these feelings of insecurity, anxiousness, um, that we're scared, that we're discouraged, it's because there's something we need that we're not getting. And so it might be that we value the direction, we value the learning and the growth that that feedback offers us, but we also need something else. And so let's take a look at the third page of the handout, those needs, and let's try to identify, let's try to brainstorm what some of those needs might be. I want to start with, it might be that I need trust or that I need support and I don't feel that the way in which I'm getting that feedback from my boss is showing me that I'm trusted or is showing me that I'm supported. Or maybe I just need space and maybe the feedback, the frequency of the feedback is putting me in a place where there's just not enough space for me to experiment on my own. Other needs that you can think of that perhaps are not being met when I'm feeling insecure and anxious and guarded um, in, in the way that I'm receiving this feedback. So think through that. Then the next thing we want to move to is starting to identify what my boss might be feeling. So this isn't only about the way we are experiencing this, but we're projecting that my boss hates everything I do. So let's try to tap in to my boss's feelings. So perhaps my boss feels um, nervous about the deadline that's ahead of us. Or maybe my boss feels uncertain that we're going to meet the deadline or stressed because their boss is putting some pressures on them 
and so that's coming out in the way that we're receiving the feedback. What are some other feelings you can imagine that the, our boss is feeling in the way that they're giving the feedback? Are they overwhelmed? Are they skeptical? Are they uneasy or unsettled? Let's try to really connect with those feelings. Then next, we want to explore what my boss needs. So those feelings of uncertainty, those feelings of concern or stress, what might that be indicating that my boss needs that she isn't getting? Does she need peace of mind that we're going to meet the deadline? Does she need reliability? Does she need recognition from her boss? And so she's worried that if the work isn't done to her expectation, she's not going to get the recognition or the appreciation that she's seeking. So you can use this needs list to brainstorm more ideas there for what those needs might be that she isn't having met. And then lastly, we want to move to requests. So we've had observations, feelings, needs, and now we're doing requests. So now as we're translating from jackal to giraffe, we're asking, how can I tell my boss how much I value her guidance and how much I value the learning but I also need trust. I also need space. I also need this freedom or autonomy to make my own mistakes. And in expressing that honestly, what are the other ways that we can together devise a strategy where she can share feedback in a way that would meet both her needs and mine. Because the strategy that's being employed for sharing that feedback today is leading me to these jackal thoughts of my boss has hates everything I do. So it's not that the feedback is wrong. It's that the strategy for delivering that feedback isn't meeting my needs. So we need to come up with a way that it can meet her needs and my needs equally. And that's what we can achieve in the form of a request. So what this does when we translate from jackal to giraffe is that we really transform the communication from one of self-criticism, judgment of others, and blame and shame to a communication that is self-empathetic, getting in touch with my own feelings and needs, empathetic of others, getting in touch with their feelings and needs, and that promotes honest self-expression, where instead of what actions might result from me thinking that my boss hates everything I do, maybe I'm going to be bitter, resentful, I'm going to act differently towards her, now, because I've connected with what I need and I've connected with what she needs, I can express myself in a much more honest way that reveals the, what's lingering beneath the surface because that jackal statement is really hiding what's actually going on. And by making this translation into a more compassionate language, compassionate towards myself and compassionate towards others, I'm able to open up the possibilities and recognize that there are abundant resources available to us, but the strategies that we're using for employing them are not meeting everyone's needs. So let's go through this process again with a second example from our jackals. Let's go through he derails every meeting. 
I want to hear, does anyone identify with this? Say so in the general channel if you've had this thought. He derails every meeting, she derails every meeting. I think this is probably a pretty common one. And what we want to do is try to translate this into something that's more productive. Because if we don't, and we keep thinking he derails every meeting, the way we react to that eventually is going to damage the relationship. It could damage our position. It could damage the other person's position. It could damage the effectiveness of how we work together. And that's not very sustainable. So we want to ensure that we are very conscious of how our thoughts can lead to actions that are unsustainable. So let's tackle this one. And again, have your sheets ready because I'm really going to need your help on this. So first, we've got to start with observations. So when I'm thinking he derails every meeting, some of the observations that I can see objectively are that he speaks at length in every meeting. He introduces topics that aren't on the meeting agenda. Other people participate less when he's in the room. We don't agree to decisions before the end of the meeting. He asks questions about decisions that have already been made. He challenges others and he changes his mind often. Those are some of the observation that I can, observations that I can make when I'm stuck with this jackal thought of he derails every meeting. What are some observations that you've experienced or that you can brainstorm now that I might be judging as derailing? I'll let you think about that for a while. Let's move now to our feelings here. So when he asks questions about decisions that have already been made, I'm just going to pick that observation to move forward with. What are some things that I might feel? So I want to hear from your perspective, what do you feel using those feelings on your handout? The feelings on the bottom half of the first page that arise when our needs aren't being met. What do you feel when you are in a meeting with someone who's asking questions about decisions that have already been made? Throw some of those out in the general channel, please. So you might feel feel you might feel agitated you might feel impatient irritable pained resentful annoyed distressed um how about bored or dismayed vexed, frustrated, chagrined, disappointed, all really challenging feelings to be feeling in that meeting when he's sitting there right in front of you or standing, pacing around the room, questioning the decisions that have already been made. And we have all been there. So... Now that we've recognized what some of those feelings are, what do those feelings point to as the needs that we have that aren't getting met? What needs do those feelings point to that, that aren't getting met? So if we're feeling frustrated and disappointed and, and impatient and irritable, what needs of ours are not being met? Perhaps we're not feeling like our need for structure is being met. 
because we had agreed to those decisions already in a previous meeting and now we're at the next phase of the process and why have a structured process if we're just going to question everything we did before. What about my need for focus? My need for focus isn't being met because we're here to talk about a new set of decisions that have to be made and he's talking about decisions that were already made. Or effectiveness. Or my need for clarity, maybe now I'm just confused because I thought those decisions were made and put to bed and we were moving on. So think about what those other needs might be in me that I can connect with when I notice how irritated and frustrated I'm getting when he questions the decisions that have already been made. Next we want to look at his feelings. This is a challenge even though we're UX practitioners and we talk about empathy for our users and empathy for our customers and we're always advocating for their needs. It is very different doing this for our customers and doing this with our colleagues. So let's try to dig deep in our empathy and brainstorm what might he be feeling if he's asking questions about decisions that have already been made. Please throw some of those out in the general channel. Might he be feeling worried? Might he be feeling regretful that he agreed to that previous decision? Might he be feeling reluctant or torn. What are some others you can think of? Worried, absolutely. Apprehensive, tense, troubled, insecure. I love tense because maybe he's very aware that he's asking questions about decisions that have already been made, but he feels like he really needs to ask the question, and so he feels tense that he's bringing it up because he knows that we've, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Maybe he's feeling pessimistic as a, a, of the, what the potential outcome is going to be based on those previous decisions, and maybe that pessimism is growing in him. Or guilty. Guilty that he agreed to it or guilty that he's bringing it up now. These are great. Thank you, everyone. So let's move on to considering his needs. So if he's feeling worried, apprehensive, tense, troubled, insecure, pessimistic, guilty, what might he be needing that currently is not being met? Might he be needing clarity? Might he be needing security? Might he be needing to be heard? Could he be needing to make a contribution, even if it's a contribution that might not be the right one at the right time? Might he be needing attention? support in in his ideas? Is he needing to be recognized, valued? Maybe he's needing comfort. Maybe he just needs to come to the decision again and so he, he's just not entirely comfortable with it. Or maybe He's really needing progress and he's not feeling like that need for progress is being met because he's wondering if that decision that was made was the right one and so he's worried about that decision and he fears that it will not lead to the progress that he really is invested in. So Oh, confidence, another great one. 
in the chat room. Thank you. Maybe he needs greater confidence in the decision, or maybe he needs self-confidence. So these are all awesome, awesome ideas of the things that he might need. And what we want to do now is put all this together to translate our jackal, he derails every meeting, into giraffe, more compassionate, more productive, more sustainable communication. So, when he asks questions about decisions that have already been made, I feel agitated, I feel resentful, irritable, annoyed, disappointed, confused, mistrustful, torn, did I say frustrated, perplexed, because I value, um, let's say, I value his contribution, and I value everyone making a contribution in the meeting, but I really need focus, and I need structure, and I need clarity. And when he questions those decisions that have already been made, those needs are not being met. But I guess he feels worried and he feels apprehensive, tense, troubled, insecure, pessimistic, guilty, because he needs support or he needs recognition. He needs to make a contribution. He needs comfort or security that isn't being met for him. So how can I tell him how much I value his contribution, but that I also need clarity and structure that the strategy he's employing for asking these que questions about decisions that have already been made in a meeting that we're there to talk about something else is getting in the way of. And how can I brainstorm the other ways to have him involved in the meeting, have him involved in the project, and to meet his needs and mine. And how can we put that in the form of a request in order to really encourage um, a, a solution that meets all of our needs? I hope that you're already seeing the power of this in those three sheets of paper that I offered you. The first sheet being the feelings that we experience when our needs are being met or when they're not being met. The second page being the faux feelings, which is what we call it in nonviolent communication, that we often say, I feel such and such, but that it's really filled with judgment and interpretation, and it's hiding our actual personal feelings underneath. And in that third page of our needs, these three pages hold the key to completely transforming the way that we communicate and the way that we connect with people in the workplace and in all aspects of our lives, leading to much more sustainable relationships and to greater social sustainability worldwide. If we all come together, as James was saying earlier, and agree to change our behaviors and to have greater consciousness in the role that we play, we can have a huge impact on the world. So to reiterate, we're going from self-criticism to self-empathy from judgment of others to empathy for others, and from blame and shame to honest self-expression. So to close, the assumptions put forth by nonviolent communication are that all actions that we take are attempts to meet our needs, and that all needs are universal. All feelings that we experience point to needs being met or unmet in us, and all conflicts that arise are over strategies, not needs. So that when we look at the needs that we have and that other people have, and we 
look to how we can devise new strategies to meet all of our needs sustainably, we create a much longer term and healthier solution. So if we recognize that all actions are attempts to meet needs, we want to make set the intention to separate our observations from judgments. In recognizing all needs are universal, we want to set the intention to care equally for everyone's needs. If all feelings point to needs being met or unmet, we need to practice self-empathy and learn what our feelings are and what needs they're indicating are met or not met in us. And if all conflicts are over strategies, not needs, we need to commit to honest self-expression so that together we can devise strategies that are more sustainable for everyone. Today's decisions will impact tomorrow's possibilities, and we are all capable of make, making new decisions and taking more sustainable actions today. Thank you so much for listening. Before the next person comes on, I just want to make sure that you have the link here, wittyhess.com slash sustainable. That's the link for my slides and the handouts. You'll get those right away. So thank you so much again for being here. And thank you so much to James and Jen for inviting me to participate in this wonderful event.